Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another show. We have here Charles Fisher, CEO of unlearn.ai, a company doing brain, uh, groundbreaking work in the biopharma space. Charles, welcome to, to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about yourself uh, for our viewers, Charles? Sure. So I'm a uh, I'm a biophysicist by training. Uh, did a bachelor's PhD in biophysics and have spent um, now more than a decade working on applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence to different areas in biology, from thinking about the impact of logging on uh, butterfly populations in the rainforest to looking at you know human gene expression to now thinking about how we can apply AI to make clinical trials uh, more effective and, and accelerate medical research. That's a pretty fascinating background, an interesting mix of uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, so at Unlearn, I understand you're doing some uh, fascinating work in digital twins. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what's your mission and what are you currently working on? Um, so you know, our goal is to, to use machine learning and AI to accelerate medical research. To, to think about what a digital twin is and its application, it's helpful to step back and ask what is the question that we're typically trying to answer in a medical research study. And so a, a typical clinical trial is trying to do some sort of comparison. You are comparing the safety and efficacy of some new therapy to whatever currently exists. And you want to know, is it better, or worse, safer, less safe? Um, and so when you do that, you want to know these two potential outcomes. So what would happen to a patient if they've received the new therapy versus what would happen if they receive the existing therapy? And so what we do with the digital twin is that we, we use machine learning methods to basically create a computer simulation of one of those scenarios. So for each patient who's enrolled in a clinical trial, we're able to create the simulation of what would happen to that patient if they received an existing therapy uh, or no therapy if there is no treatment for that particular disease. Okay, and that's a pretty ambitious goal in terms of uh, simulating and predicting um, reactions to the human body. As a practitioner in the machine learning space, I've seen how um, the industry is still struggling with accuracy of the models and outcomes at times uh, you really can't be sure about. Um, so uh, isn't it more challenging and uh, given the complex human body, uh, do you think this is something uh, we are very close to? Uh, so, I mean, we're doing it today, but we're not doing it by simulating the actual like biochemistry of a person. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if you think about that sort of same scenario I set up before, you have this comparison of two treatments, right? One is brand new, and we actually, in principle, don't know anything about it, right? So, so uh, we don't know how it works. We don't know if it works. The only way to do anything with that is actually to give it to people and to see what happens. So we're not simulating how patients respond to brand new treatments where there's no data. We're asking how are our patients going to respond to existing treatments? And so what we can do is we can collect data, longitudinal patient data from tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people and see how they have been responding to this existing treatment. So how long have companies uh, been uh, trying to do this? Well, one could say maybe since computers have existed, people haven't, haven't trying to do this kind of thing. I think that as as far as I'm aware, we're the first company to think about uh, a tr a, this application, to think about how we can leverage these machine learning methods, leverage these data sets to try to um, to try to make clinical trials much, much more efficient. That said, there is a long history of pharmaceutical companies trying to use existing data within clinical trials. So an example might be something that's called a historical control. So if you've previously run a clinical trial um, where you've given, say, you've given a bunch of patients placebo, why would you not reuse those data in a new, in a new trial, your next trial? That's an ex example. You might just take those trials and treat it again as placebo data in your new trial, and then you don't need to enroll another placebo arm. Um, and th so that's been used for a long time. The difficulty is that um, it actually gets to your earlier question that there's a lot of biology that we don't understand and we don't know. So you have this question, well, would that old patient population, say I ran a study five years ago, I want to reuse those data. 
is that comparable to my new patient population today? Mm -hmm. And we can look at things we know about, like we can measure people's age, we can measure certain things about people, um, but there's a lot we don't know about. And we can't know, because we don't know about it, whether or not those populations are the same in those dimensions. So the problem is that historical controls and these other approaches that have been around for a really long time, they can potentially cause you to make a wrong decision. Okay, okay, understood. Uh, and one of the things which stood out uh, when I looked at um, your website, you mentioned about using small data as opposed to uh, traditionally AI companies uh, talking about large volumes of data. Uh, so uh, is there fundamentally a very different approach uh, you're using and how you're able to tap into small volumes to get your job done? Mm -hmm. So if you're working in healthcare, you have to work on small data. There is no option for you to work on big data. There is no such thing as a big data set. Um, not only that, you have to work with really messy data. It's small, messy data, um, because that's just what's available. The other aspect here is that everything we're looking at is how patients change over time. Uh, because that's really what we want to know. Is this patient's disease getting better? Is it getting worse? Are they having more symptoms or less over time? So we're really focused on sort of that, those kind of like time series problems in AI, which is very different from like an image recognition problem that you might be working on if you're doing like self-driving car research. And so, yeah, we, we have very different technology, very different solutions, but it's really driven by the domain. I think that you generally see that when you look at AI, that the solutions are actually quite, we're so far from like AGI, right? Like uh, general intelligence. That's not what anyone has. We have domain specific solutions. And so we work in a really specific domain of like, how do you apply machine learning to electronic health record style data? Right. Yeah. Uh, my uh, next question is, what are some milestones in AI research that you think would, could improve the effectiveness of whatever is possible today? Okay. I think that the milestone for us is going to be in fixing these small, messy data, <laughs> messy data problems in healthcare. What will really, really drive um, this area forward is getting better data sets. Um, okay. And I think that's, that's a combination of having, uh, I, I'd say one is just better electronic health records. Um, right now, electronic health records exist primarily to inform billing. Of, of patients. And they're less collected for this idea of like, you know, uh, an evolving research agenda. Um, and I think that that would be something that would be a, a change that, that would be very beneficial of, of trying to actually have more and more patients participating in some kind of research, whether that's just an observational study, not necessarily an interventional trial. Um, in terms of the usage in this area, uh, what are the challenges you see from a regulatory standpoint? I think that's one critical milestone for organizations to start using it. None. <laughs> so this is always very, uh, it's always very surprising to people. Um, so it's, uh, it depends on, it, it depends on how you use it. That's what's really, really important. Depends on how you use it. Um, so the way that we propose people use these methods within their clinical trials um, is acceptable according to current regulatory guidance. So if you read guidance from FDA or EMA now, the guidance is that they currently have, then if you use the approach we tell you to, then you should not have any particular problems. Um, uh, you know, that does involve interpreting guidance, um, which is maybe not uh, an activity everyone wants wants to do. So we are currently going through qualification procedures at FDA and EMA, basically validating that we are covered under the current guidance. And so there are kind of two ways I, I would think about that. So one is if you're staying within clinical trials, but you want to do something outside of the way we propose you use it, um, you probably can only do that for like a phase two clinical trial. Um, or potentially if you're working in a, a disease area that where there's very small patient population, like a r very rare disease, and you know because of it's very severe disease, maybe the FDA will will have diff they do sometimes have different uh, requirements for how you know you generate evidence in those cases because it's so difficult. If there's if there's 100 patients on Earth with the disease, how are you going to run a 1,000 patient clinical trial? Right, like you have to take a different approach. The other aspect would be um, if you wanted to try to use 
a patient's digital twin, this prediction to guide some actual treatment decision for that patient. So you're doing some sort of clinical decision support. This is not something that we currently are pursuing. Okay. Okay. That's, I think that's a, a very encouraging view of how you're trying to take it step by step and, uh, and make it mainstream. Uh, are there any companies or therapeutic areas where you're already applying this early stages? Most of, of our current work is in Alzheimer's disease. Um, although we're rapidly expanding into to other other disease areas as well, uh, initially focused on like neurosciences, so Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, Huntington's disease, um, but then also expanding into sort of immunological uh, and inflammatory disorders. Um, so. We're, we're building sort of this portfolio and working with different companies. You know, one example is, uh, is, you know, one of our investors is actually the Japanese pharmaceutical company, ASI, who's one of the leaders in the Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, therapy space. And so, you know, we're working with companies uh, across these different disease areas uh, to, to try to start working on accelerating both phase two and phase three clinical trials. Okay. Um, what could go wrong with this technology if you were to take a uh, uh, if you were to take a slightly different view, and uh, what are the risks that you foresee? So, if you use the technology the way we tell you to, nothing can go wrong. Nothing. I mean, literally, nothing can go wrong. We actually have a proof of that. I don't mean even mean like we have a mathematical proof. It's actually a really interesting way to think about AI. I, I like to think about AI bias and AI sort of like, which is a really important topic. Um, but I like to think about it a little bit differently. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how people can create unbiased machine learning and AI algorithms. And I don't think that you can. I think that your AI machine learning algorithms being data driven will reflect the bias in the data. There's not much you can do. Um, so the, what we have to do instead is think about the use. And what we have to say is, OK, well, we're going to apply a model that's going to be, first of all, not perfect, right? The models themselves always making errors and they may make systematic errors and, and introduce bias. And we want to make sure that the way we use them, our users don't experience any of, that, any of that bias. And it's a very different way of thinking about it. So rather than focusing on can we make our models perfect, we cannot. We cannot make them perfect, but we can ensure that the clinical trial that we use it in has the right properties. We can ensure that the statistics of that clinical trial come out right. And you're you're saying AI is not dangerous. It is the people who put it to use. They use it in the wrong ways. That's what causes the danger. <laughs> Last question: What do you think would be an excellent outcome, like dream outcome? It doesn't matter whether it's five years, ten years, but if you can achieve that, like something that you are most excited about. You know, I, I think that for us we want to have a measurable impact on the pace of medical research. Um, and so the way we do that is basically by reducing the number of patients that are needed to enroll in a clinical trial. And then you can, you can run that clinical trial a lot faster because you don't need so many uh, volunteers. And so, you know, we can reduce, you know, clinical trial sizes safely, very, very safely by let's say 25%. So if we could do that across the board and see, say, you know, that actually translate into a measurable pace of, of, of saying, you know, instead of taking five years to run an on average clinical trial, it only takes four years, it only takes three years. I think that if we could actually see that and measure that and then put that out um, and sort of expand across the entire um, sort of like medical research community, you're talking about what, what's a real multiplier effect for medical research that that benefits patients down the line because they're getting lots and lots of, of new new drugs, benefits the whole industry um, because, you know, for every biotech pharmaceutical company, for them to be able to run a clinical trials faster, it's less expensive. Um, so we'd really like to be able to measure that progress um, and see, you know, the, the actual average time it takes for a clinical trial decreasing uh, over time. Um, that, you know, to be able to measure that requires us to have a very large market share. Okay, I think that's a very clear quantified outcome for an AI researcher. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I am a physicist, right? So, like, <laughs> I want to see, I want to see a number. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I thought you were going to talk about solving the, the world's problems and, and <laughs> some future diseases. Yeah, but no, I understand. I think effectively you're talking about the same thing, but accelerating and it can have huge impact. Fair enough, uh, highly aligned. But thanks, Charles. It has been a pleasure talking to you and, and, and a very interesting area and good luck with your work. Thanks, thanks very much. much.